Good afternoon. Today we have a unique webinar uh, on gene therapy. This has been one of our um, topics that we've wanted to talk about for some time. And gene therapy is a very interesting subject in the longevity uh, space. Um, it's one of the most promising technologies uh, of our of our time. And a lot of people have thought in the past that these uh, tools and techniques uh, wouldn't be around for many years, but it uh, turns out that people have been getting gene therapies uh, for uh, almost a decade now. And today we will have two speakers uh, given a short overview of what gene therapy is, uh, how you can use it to increase your health and longevity. Uh, as well as uh, some of the results we've seen uh, in people um, doing these uh, therapies on, on themselves. So today we have uh, Kyle Brewer, who is the founder and CEO of ETTA Biotechnology. Uh, Kyle has been uh, doing a lot of research on longevity and tissue targeting and mRNA uh, techniques and a wide variety of different uh, techniques and tools that he's been working on um, while he's been doing his research uh, at Stanford. And um, thanks, Kyle, for, for uh, com coming, on, coming on today. And we also have Paul Tazor, who is a longevity biohacker, is uh, primarily his day job. He's gotten all kinds of um, therapies on himself uh, and has, been, has also worked in the gaming industry for over 25 years and uh, has a lot of expertise in this uh, field as well. And we also have today uh, Liz Parrish and Johnny Adams. And uh, Liz Parrish um, is the founder and CEO of BioViva. And Johnny Adams is the leader of the GRG group, uh, which is a group that focuses on gerontology research and bringing a lot of these new uh, methods and insights to our reality uh, quicker for uh, for health. So I'll, I'll let Kyle take it away. He's going to give a little overview on gene therapy. What are the trade-offs between these methods? Um, what's on the horizon? And uh, what do we expect to see in the near term uh, for these tools? So thanks a lot, Kyle. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. I think that's a great intro. And um, yeah, I'm surprised because what you just said is, is basically exactly what I'm going to show. So I'll go, ahead, I'll go ahead and share the screen here and bring this up. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the past of gene therapy, where we are now, and also the future. And it's kind of a blend in between. And um, I'm, I'm someone who's a really big proponent of gene therapy. And I realized when I was making this presentation, there's a lot of very negative things that have happened in the past. But I think we're at the point where it's starting to become accessible to almost everyone. And we kind of know what the problems with gene therapy have been in the past now and uh, potentially how to, how to address them. So it's something that's becoming something that was for very serious diseases. And I think it still is to something that's more accessible to everyone. And of course, with COVID vaccines, um, a large percentage of the population now have received the gene therapy. Um, and if you haven't gotten the COVID vaccine, there may be something that will come in the next few years that may save your life if you have a very serious disease as well. So um, it's something that's going to be very important for the future. So it's important to know about. So a little bit about my background. Um, I won't read all of this, but just in case you want to look at all this. Um, so I have a uh, greater than 15 years experience in biotechnology, and I have a really big focus on delivery of small molecules, DNA, mRNA, and proteins. I was a second scientist at Rejuvenation Technologies, which was a Stanford startup. Um, also uh, to extend telomeres using mRNA. And uh, during my graduate school studies, I was lucky enough to collaborate with the Nobel Prize winners, just out of a coincidence. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, which helped me out a lot um, during my graduate school studies to get recognition for my research. And it helped me to move into a really great postdoc at, at Stanford, where I worked in this lab of Tony Weiss Carre. This is this lab that does these young blood transfusions to study brain aging. And then uh, one of our collaborators won the Nobel Prize recently. Uh, so that was another surprise. Um, 
And uh, I recently founded Edo Biotechnology, basically taking uh, studies that have been done on aging in mice and translating those into humans and overcoming the problems that are, are currently there. And so right now we could probably take some of these therapies and they may extend people's lifespans by 10 to 30 years. So it's something that could be very effective for people's lives. And actually uh, the thing I'm working now is on, on small molecules, uh, but I do have plans for gene therapy as well. So um, first thing I wanted to talk about is just why gene therapy is important for you. So if you're viewing this video, uh, you're probably already thinking it's important for you, but if you just came across it by coincidence. Um, so one reason is all major pharmaceutical companies now have mRNA nanoparticle divisions. So there's gonna be a ton of new therapies that are gene therapies that are coming out, uh, mainly having to do with mRNA, but there will be other ones as well. And so basically, uh, if you put money in, you're going to get therapies out. And so uh, most of these are either for uh, vaccinations or for cancer. So uh, if you happen to get cancer in the future, there may be a new mRNA therapy that could potentially save your life. So this could be very important for, for you or someone you know, and like a friend or your family. Uh, another reason is venture capital is heavily investing in gene therapy platforms. So people have pretty much decided that gene therapy is going to be the future, whether we want it to be or not. So this is something that's going to be increasingly uh, a therapeutic mo modality. Um, and I think it's one tool in the toolbox. So like I said, I'm working on small molecules right now, which I still think are, are very important. Um, and I think people kind of think, oh, gene therapy, it's like this magic tool that will solve everything. That's not really true, but it can do a lot. So the third point is gene therapy or engineering can potentially control all of biology. And I put potentially in bold here because uh, people do think of it as some like magic bullet that can do everything, but this is just uh, a potential thing that can happen. And I think we need to develop the tools to actually do this. So uh, the tools are definitely not there yet. So I'm gonna be talking about a lot of the problems and also where we're at now and what's gonna happen in the future. So one thing that I wanna talk about first is kind of the problems that happened in the past. And whenever I first started thinking like, oh, gene therapy, this is something that could be a really good idea for people in, in grad school. And I, I was like, why, why are not more people working on this? And um, what I learned then was kind of the background of the field. And so in 1999, there was a, gene therapy trial by the University of Pennsylvania. And it was run quite badly. And then uh, uh, a young man in the clinical trial ended up dying. Uh, he was 18 years old. And so this set back the gene therapy field by a lot. And the, the major problems with this trial that were ignored were uh, monkeys that were given the treatment ended up dying. And so probably the trial should have never happened for that reason. Um, so. Uh, I think a lot of the problems in this trial were that basically it wasn't the gene therapy itself, it's that, that basic safety protocols were not uh, recognized. So I think this is something that in the future going forward, we need to keep in mind. But also we know a lot about gene therapy now where hopefully these problems will not occur so much again. So one, uh, monkeys died when giving the treatment, so probably should not have been started. Uh, Jesse himself should not have been eligible for this treatment because he was basically uh, part of the exclusion criteria due to his high ammonia levels in his blood. And then two other patients also had serious side effects that weren't reported. So I think just uh, going by some basic safety protocols, we can avoid things like this. And um, this also, since it, it, this happened, it set back the field 10 years. And um, what ended up happening was as a result of this, the person who actually ran the clinical trial actually developed the, the next stage that actually made this safer. So as a result of this trial, James Wilson, who actually ran the trial, um, was banned by the FDA for five years. And uh, he realized, I, I think like any of us would, if we went through this, that we you, you made a huge mistakes and um, you also did something that wasn't safe for gene therapy. Uh, and so he ended up developing what's called the AAV, the adeno-associated virus a little bit different than adenovirus that was used in the initial trial. So, um, and this is basically the main therapeutic modality that's used for gene therapy currently. It's used for a lot of rare diseases. And um, so one thing that I, I heard him say in a, a webinar uh, a couple of years ago was he said, it's not about what's popular, but what's the right thing to do. So you can imagine after this, there's probably a major backlash. Um, 
he probably, uh, probably, uh, if it was any of us, we would have probably left our career and um, probably uh, not been involved with this again. But he took it as an opportunity to say, like, uh, I made huge mistakes and I wanted to make this better. So, and I think he he's done that now. So, like for example, I was working with AAVs at Stanford. And um, I had to get a license from University of Pennsylvania to use this. So it's, this is someone to keep in mind because it's important for um, using AAVs and kind of knowing the background as well. So this is kind of an example of AAVs that are used in mice. So now there's tons of different versions of AAVs. And the main reason people develop AAVs for different reasons is there are certain ones that are better at infecting different cell types. There are certain ones that, uh, that are better at infecting uh, tissues overall. So there's generally uh, the AAVs that you'll see mostly are AAV 1 through 9. And so you see AAV 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 8, 7, 9 here. And you can see they have dramatically different infectivity rates. Most of the time when you inject an AAV, it will go to the liver. And that's one of the big problems with gene therapy currently is it's very difficult to target the tissues you actually want to target. Um, if you inject anything, pretty much it will go to the liver. So if you're developing a liver therapy, that's great. But if you're developing something else, maybe it's a, a little bit more challenging. And so for example, here, you can see AAV seven and nine, they actually will distribute throughout the body. And then as you go throughout time from day 14 up to day 100, you can see the expression kind of starts in the liver and then it ends up going to uh, the lower part of the body. So this is something that's very difficult to control. And so I think in the future, this is gonna be something that people have to develop. Um, to be better. There's a couple other examples that I point out here. AVDJ, which was developed um, at Mark, in Mark Kay's lab at, at Stanford, who also developed some of the mini circle technology that you guys will be talking about. Um, it really targets the liver very specifically. You can see here, out of all these organs, it targets the very uh, uh, specifically the liver. And this is important because uh, like you can see here, there's not a lot of specificity but the AVDJ kind of had higher liver specificity, so it's really good at targeting. On top of that, there have been people who have made AAVs to target the brain recently. So um, there's these different versions called the AAV PHPS, PHPB, and PHPEB. So the PHPS targets the spinal cord, and you can see here the spinal cord that's targeted. The PHPB targets the brain, and the PHPEB um, is called enhanced brain, uh, targets the brain a little bit better. And people are now developing all sorts of different serotypes of these AAVs to target different tissues. And so I think as time goes on, people will get better and better at targeting, but it's still a very difficult process. Normally, if you inject something uh, into the bloodstream, it'll pretty much just go to the liver. So this is something that needs to be overcome to have really effective uh, gene therapies. Another really great thing about AAVs is the time uh, course can last for years. So you can have a one dose therapy and you can have a treatment for several years. And so uh, these clinical trials have been ongoing for a long time. And some of the AAV can even remain to have a gene expression for 10 years, uh, albeit the level does reduce. So it's not something that's permanent, um, but it is something that can last a very long time. So this is something that is very positive to have as a treatment. You don't have to take every day. You can just have one dose and basically your treatment is managed. This is an example of an AV plasmid that uh, I actually made at Stanford. And basically it's, it's very simple to make. All you have to do is you have to put in uh, a promoter which drives the expression of the gene and then the gene itself. And I was using this for uh, genetic engineering purposes and not necessarily a treatment. But um, it's it's something that's very simple that almost anyone can do now. Um, undergraduates can do this. Even high school students and sometimes even medical school students are doing this. So it's something that's becoming more and more accessible where almost anyone can make a gene therapy that could be a treatment. So this is something that can be very positive where um, in the past, maybe even 20 years ago, if you're going to develop a therapy, it's generally going to be a small molecule that takes a long time and it requires a lot of expertise to develop. But now it's basically like a plug and play system where you have your, your plasmid, you put in a new gene, and all of a sudden you have a new therapy. And it really is that simple. Um, so AV and clinical use. 2017, the first FDA approved AV therapy was made, and um, it was AV 
uh, what's called Lux Turna for retinal eye disease. And um, this is exactly uh, what I saw in the FDA documents. They have uh, the ITRs, which control uh, basically the gene being put into the AAVs, and they have a promoter, so enhancer and promoter regions, and the exon uh, one and intron one are basically part of this, and then the gene, and then uh, a prose translational element. So it's not really that complicated. Uh, almost anyone who can do basic cloning in the lab can actually make this therapy. And so if you want to make an AAV, you can actually do that now, and it could potentially become a new drug. So that's very exciting that anyone who wants to get involved in this field uh, can. Uh, one of the big problems with AAV, though, as you can see here, is it's very expensive. People are working on this. Um, so AAVs, if they're having a really tough time getting this cost down. So I think there may be other therapeutic modalities that have a, a much greater reduced cost, such as using nanoparticles rather than AAVs. <clears throat> but um, for eye injection, they basically it costs $425,000 per eye. And so if you do both eyes, that's $850,000. So it's quite expensive. And after this was approved, uh, Spark Therapeutics, who made Luxerna, was required by Roche for $4.8 billion. So basically, this is showing that if you can do basic cloning, you could potentially make uh, a several billion dollar drug. So this is very exciting for people who want to make companies. And it's very exciting because almost anyone can do this as well. So uh, I think we have the ability for many people to get involved in this field and start making potential uh, gene therapies that can go through clinical trials. And the cost has gone up even more. So this kind of just highlights the need for better costs. So uh, hemogenics for hemophilia was developed and it cost 3.5 millions per dose. So the cost is going up, not down. But I think as people start looking for um, other ways to do this, I think the cost will go down a lot. Something else that's very important to realize is that the blood immune response can neutralize AAV in up to 60% of patients. So it's, if it's injected into the bloodstream, uh, it may not work. And so I think targeting things like eye diseases or um, doing injections into the brain for rare diseases could be a better way to go for AAVs. And it also highlights the need for other therapies as well that are alternatives to AAVs. Um, one unfortunate thing is that AAVs have run into more problems. So uh, James Wilson, who uh, ran the initial adenovirus trial and then developed AAVs in 2018, he published a paper showing there's toxicity to neurons and hepatocytes in uh, monkeys and piglets. And um, then basically he uh, highlighted this as a big warning to the field to be very careful with this. And unfortunately, this was kind of ignored. Uh, well, it wasn't ignored so much, but um, I think we could have done better to recognize that these could be problems. Uh, so in uh, 2020 and 2021, part of some clinical trials, four children died in an AV trial. And um, this was uh, really very unfortunate. Um, most of the people who are receiving this are children with very serious diseases. Um, so it's something that I think we should probably uh, do, but at the same time, we definitely need to be more careful with these AAV trials. And I think what we learned from this is that the high dose group was basically the main problem here. Um, so delivering high doses of AAVs can be really toxic. So um, basically the, uh, there's upcoming FDA guidance that will probably focus on limiting empty capsids, uh, which are capsids that do not actually have the gene in it. And um, basically there's uh, new purification techniques to get rid of these empty capsids. And on top of that, uh, there may be some problems with partial capsids as well, as well that can basically carry over some cellular material from the cells where these AAVs are made. So this, I think this is going to be something that definitely needs improvement. And um, But uh, this is something that's going to get safer and safer as we go along. And then, as I said, uh, there's about 50% of people who are immune to AAVs. Um, but one very surprising thing that's maybe more interesting is that people thought AAVs would have a problem with cancer. And the reason why is that uh, one and maybe 10,000 cells, they can actually have the DNA that's delivered by AAVs integrate into the genome. So uh, when this happens, you could potentially develop a cancer from this. But there's been about 3,000 patients uh, as last checked. Um, I think that was a few years ago. So there's probably 6,000 or more that have received AAV therapies now. Uh, 
uh, basically cancer has not really been a problem as far as I know. So um, basically this shows that the problem that we think was gonna happen, which was cancer with these AVs actually integrating the genome, this is not actually the problem. And the problem that is occurring is the toxicity from the capsid itself. So this just goes to show that we don't know what's gonna happen with gene therapy. So we need to be careful, but at the same time, uh, the problems that we think are gonna occur probably will not, which is a good thing. So there are some AAV alternatives out there. One thing that's emerging is the herpes simplex virus. Um, and this is actually used for melanoma. So there's an FDA approved therapy for this where basically you do direct injection to melanoma lesions. So uh, you can actually take advantage of the toxicity from this by targeting cancer. So there's a lot of therapies that are targeting cancer. And there's also a lentivirus, which is administered to HSCs ex vivo. Uh, and this is kind of uh, not in the same category because the cells that are treated are actually outside the patient and then are put back into the patient. But it also can kind of stimulate how you think about this where maybe you don't have to deliver directly to the patient that could be potentially more toxic. You could do it outside of the patient. So one alternative to, to using gene therapy in AAVs is actually using mRNA lipid nanoparticles. These are generally a little bit less toxic, um, but there are problems as well that I'll talk about. So the mRNA lipid nanoparticle, uh, we've all heard of it now, um, and, but what actually is it? So it's mainly a composition of four lipids. Uh, there's a pegylated lipid, which basically is a, a normal lipid, which has this peg group polymer that's coming off of it that helps with the stability. There's a cationic lipid, which helps the mRNA to be released into the cell. There's a help, helper lipid and cholesterol, which are just uh, basically very standard lipids that are also used to construct the lipid nanoparticle. And then all this is used to encapsulate the mRNA. And it can be actually one or more mRNAs. So we're seeing this where people are actually using uh, several mRNAs to treat different conditions um, so I think this is something we're going to see more and more of is that, so if you can make one mRNA, you can make several and um, they basically have, they can have very similar safety profiles all at once. So you can actually put them in complex to treat diseases, which can be potentially safer or more effective. So how is this actually made? You mix the lipids in ethanol and you uh, then mix the mRNA in water and then you remove the ethanol. So it's not that complicated to make. So this is also something that's, that's very accessible to people. Um, so it's something that can also be used by many people as well. So what are the problems with mRNA nanoparticles and toxicology? So this is something that really isn't talked about as much, but I think it's something to really uh, recognize. And um, so the reason that I wanna bring this up is that there are some problems that can be addressed, but people don't really know about them. So. And, and some people do know about them as well. Uh, so basically one of the, the big problems, the first generation cationic lipids can be toxic at higher doses. So uh, like the dose in a vaccine, it's probably not that big of a deal, but the dose that's delivered for a gene therapy that may be for like a liver disease, um, those are actually can be hundreds of times more than a dose in a vaccine. And then the cationic lipid that can be toxic um, starts to become a problem. So there are new versions of these cationic lipids that have dramatically reduced toxicity to cells. Um, and so you're gonna start seeing these in gene therapies as well, but it's still something that needs to be improved and can be improved even further. The pegylated lipid also uh, has been a problem because it's PEG is in a lot of consumer products. So people naturally have antibodies due to exposure from PEG. And this is actually has been a problem with the vaccines as well where um, if you were vaccinated, you, you had to go into a room and sit for 10 minutes. And this is the reason why, is you may have an anaphylactic uh, allergic reaction. And basically this is something that can occur at a, um, a very quick reaction. And another problem to realize is that the gene delivered is actually important. So such as the, the COVID vaccines, uh, you're delivering the spike protein, which is a foreign protein. And so you're, your body's gonna to respond to this and uh, it may have negative reactions and we may have reactions that are unexpected as well. And so for example, the spike protein, it can lead to cellular damage and blood clotting, which has been a problem for many people. So it's important to realize 
that whenever you're delivering a gene, uh, think about what that gene can do and also study that as well. And I think when we kind of realize that we can make much safer therapies. And uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of delivering genes that are uh, natural to humans because it's basically adding on to what's already there and it's probably gonna have a much safer reaction. So I think mRNA for gene therapy may be very important. One of the things that's kind of coming online now is circular mRNA. And the reason why is mRNA expression will only last for uh, a day or two. And so uh, if you wanna have a gene therapy that you don't have to deliver every few days, uh, we kind of need a solution for this. And so the solution that kind of the field and uh, pharma has kind of come up with is circular RNA. And so circular RNA is just as the name implies, it's instead of it's a linear gene, it's a, a circle that's uh, you take an RNA and you can actually circularize it. And the reason you do this is it increases the stability of the RNA so it can last uh, for several days. Um, but the problem with circular RNAs are expression, it's not necessarily gonna last longer. So many of them do, but I've seen expression that lasts basically as long as an mRNA up to like a week or two. And the other problem is that the expression can be much lower than mRNA expression as well. And you can see this here. So mRNA in the pink, uh, basically after 24 hours, the expression uh, doesn't last for very long, but uh, the circular mRNA, it can last for several days, but then the expression dies off. But you can see uh, even at this early time point, the expression is much lower than mRNA. So there's still a lot of work that can be done there as well. Something that's gonna be uh, used in the very near future is controllable gene therapy. So you can deliver a gene such as with an AAV, and then instead of using an mRNA that will only last for a few days, you could turn it off or on using uh, another delivered drug such as doxycycline um, that you could take orally. And so kind of how this works is you have a, a gene and there are two versions of this, what's called a uh, TET on and TET off. So uh, with this system, basically the gene is being expressed all the time. And then whenever you hit, take doxycycline, it binds to these protein elements and basically the gene expression will turn off. And there's another version that's off most of the time, but if you wanna turn it on for a short time, you could take doxycycline to turn it on. So this is a, a great system that's used a lot in research and has a really big potential for clinical applications as well. But the big problem with this is expression is leaky. So if the gene is on all the time and you wanna turn it off, it, necessar it won't necessarily be all the way off. And if it's off uh, potentially all the time, you can actually have some expression. So the system isn't perfect. So there are things that can be done here as well. And um, I won't talk a lot about gene delivery, but it's still very primitive. So one thing that I saw that really kind of highlights this is Moderna and AstraZeneca wanted to make a new mRNA for heart failure. And how they actually delivered this is injecting uh, messenger RNA directly into the heart. So I think for this, it's, it's heart failure. So obviously it's a very serious disease. Um, and it basically that, that's probably okay. But for a lot of, a lot of therapies uh, that may be for less serious diseases, um, it's something that needs to be worked on. Um, so right now we have no way of delivering something into the vein in someone's arm, then going to the heart. Um, and so basically this is just highlighting that gene delivery is still very primitive and it needs a lot of development to really become mainstream. So we kind of think of gene therapy as something that's very futuristic. And right now it's, it's really not. So there's a lot of work that can be done. And just, uh, this is the last slide. So in the near future, I think we're not really prepared what's gonna happen with gene therapy. And the reason we're not prepared is that things are changing a lot. So for example, uh, the Broad Institute, they have what's called this con connectivity map and they have a lot of data on this. So they have 1.5 million gene expression pro profiles. They've taken 5,000 molecules and applied them to cells and 3,000 genetic reagents. And basically out of this, they get all the RNA expression data that can be used to apply to certain diseases. So for example, you could say, okay, you have the cell in a disease state. And then you can ask, uh, okay, what are the necessary changes? Uh, what would be the small molecules or genes I need to apply to the cell to take it from the disease state back as far as possible to the normal state? 
And uh, kind of the way you do this, and I've seen people do this in a research setting, is you will come up with an AI machine learning algorithm to say, okay, we have all these gene expression profiles when we apply these small molecules or genes, what actually happens to the cell state? And then you can say like, okay, what are the combinations of all these different genes or small molecules to actually make this happen? And kind of how I think about this uh, is we really think we understand biology, but we really don't. And kind of the example that I always use is this chess program that was published in 1983. It's a very small chess program back when uh, storage space was limited. And it was published in this magazine, Your Computer. So basically someone just wrote out this code. And if you look at it, uh, you can't understand what it does. Maybe the person who wrote it does, but they, they probably don't understand it either. So this is basically what's occurring in our bodies and all of our cells. There's all this weird code that's going on. Uh, it's really tough for any human to understand, but it ends up doing something. And I think if we apply AI machine learning algorithms, we can actually start to understand what's going on just because that amount of information can be processed by a computer. And so I think what we're going to have in the future is gene therapies that you may have uh, five, 10, maybe 50 different genes that are expressed to take the, the disease state or the age state as far as possible back to the normal state. Uh, but also this comes up with a problem as well, where this is way different than what's occurred in the past. So like the FDA has to basically approve these therapies. And uh, in the past, they would have one simple, very small molecule. And so they could kind of navigate that. Um, but what happens whenever you take uh, all of a sudden like 50 different genes and say, okay, FDA, we want to make this therapy that has 50 different genes. They're going to say, no way. Uh, this is way too complicated. You're going to need to show that each of these genes are safe on their own. And then you could maybe start combining them. Um, but at the same time, this is really going to limit innovation and potential treatments for people. And then pe what people are going to do is probably uh, find other ways to use them, either using biohacking or go overseas. And uh, this could be, uh, uh, it maybe could help people, but it also has a lot of risk as well. So I, I've kind of thought about how can we actually navigate this? And kind of the best answer I, I came up with is that the FDA should allow combination therapeutics to be treated as standalone drugs, if within reason, or if potentially safer. And so if within reason, that's something that will change with time. So now if you use two, two genes at once, that's maybe reasonable. If you use 10, that's maybe too much. But in the future, probably the near future, someone's going to show that using several genes at once is actually safe. And so it'll become more reasonable over time. And then the other reason, if it's potentially safer. For example, if you deliver something and then you have like you have one gene that's causing an effect, but you know there's a little bit of toxicity with that gene. But you, if you deliver this other gene, it will protect that toxicity. So that's another reason why you may want to deliver two things at once. It could actually be safer. So I think this is a way to potentially navigate this um, to make this a better future for gene therapy. So kind of overall in this presentation, I just wanted to show the problems in the past, what's going to happen in the future. So I think we're not ready for what's going to happen in the future, but it's going to be something that uh, could potentially change therapeutics forever and also help people more than uh, medicine has ever helped them. So, but we need to be careful at the same time. And I, this is uh, my email. If anyone wants to reach out, I'm happy to talk about anything related to gene therapy or your problems or uh, potential solutions for gene therapy. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, it's got a lot, lot of questions uh, and maybe I'll just jump right into them, uh, but well, well done. Yeah, that, was, that was very, very informative though, across the board. Um, appreciate that. Uh, so first question, uh, you know, in terms of like integrating into the genome, um, you know, mRNA, lipid nanoparticles versus AAV, you know, delivering genes with both these methods. I mean, how 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 do we know if it's integrated in the genome across different parts of the body? Like, do we know like like what level of conviction can we can we say like hundred percent it didn't integrate or could have? Like, what's kind of the spectrum of probabilities of actually integrating there? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple ways to answer this. One is uh, this can be done in a lab. So basically, you can apply a gene therapy to a lot of different cells or a mouse, and then you can potentially take 
the cells from that mouse and test them all at once. With a human, it's more difficult to do. So if you actually give someone a therapy um, and like, for example, targeting, uh, I'm trying to think of something that's not uh, targeting the liver. So um, you maybe could potentially take a biopsy of the liver and see whether the gene actually did integrate into the genome. But at the same time, people don't want to get biopsies of the liver for no reasons. So it's something that's very difficult to uh, look at within humans. Uh, and a way that people have kind of done it in uh, a therapeutic setting is look in people's bloodstreams to see if that gene is still being made for uh, uh, like mRNA, for example. With AAVs, it's a little bit uh, tougher to access because the AAV is going to be produced over time. So you don't actually know whether it's integrated or not because it's supposed to last a long time and not integrate. So it's it's a tough question to ask. Probably the best way to answer this is whether it happens in a lab setting or not. Um, okay. But that may not necessarily be a bad thing. So uh, the reason I say that is we're assaulted by gene therapies all the time that are coming from the outside world, which are uh, external viruses, bacteria, where they're all over our skin all the time. We're breathing them in all the time. They're everywhere. And so this has happened for billions of years. And so we've been assaulted by gene therapies for all this time. And our cells actually have ways to respond to this. So um, this is kind of like people thought cancer was going to be a big problem with gene therapy, but it really hasn't been. And now there's been thousands of people who have been dosed, probably for that reason. We do have ways to respond to these threats that may lead to cancer. Um, it's not going to uh, our responses aren't going to work all the time, and that's why we develop cancers, um, even from some viruses that, that are um, in our environment. But uh, our cells do have ways to respond to this. No, that, that makes sense. I mean, so let's say, like, just in within the blood, like, let's say you you know you get a gene therapy, either one of these, uh, it goes into your blood, and then you can take a sample of that blood, say the next day or a couple of days later. I mean, the DNA. I mean, you have it should be pretty much stable at when you take a snapshot before the gene therapy and, and after, I mean, can that DNA be changed by the gene therapy from, or uh, would you just have these floating segments of the mRNA within the cell? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. So the, if you're looking at the, looking for the protein in the blood, it depends on the lifetime of the protein. The average half-life of a protein in the bloodstream is about 24 hours. So you can potentially even detect it a week later um, if it's still like a, a minimal level is still there. Um, and the DNA, your DNA changes to basically anything that happens to you uh, via epigenetic changes. And um, so, but basically you're like looking to see if that gene has been integrated into the genome. And sometimes you can even detect that in the bloodstream. So for example, uh, for example, Grail Therapeutics looks for changes that happens to your cells that are then released into the bloodstream um, because often damaged cells, they do uh, kind of lice or they undergo apoptosis and then that cell gets released, uh, that uh, genetic material from the cell gets released into the bloodstream that can be detected. So it's, it's a complicated question, but yeah, your, your uh, DNA is gonna change to anything via epigenetic changes um, and you may be able to detect the DNA as well, but you may not under certain circumstances. I see. Yeah, I guess, I mean, you could, I guess you could sequence your DNA before, do the gene therapy and say you're adding in a gene that you know you didn't have to begin with. And then you could sequence your DNA again and say, okay, is my gene, is that gene now in the blood? Maybe that. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem that has been is like, if you're doing this for a serious disease, which gene therapies generally are now, uh, it's generally something that's internal. So it's like, okay, uh, I have to take a biopsy. Um, sometimes you can do skin, um, but oftentimes it's not delivered to skin that well. Um, so like you would have to take an internal biopsy and that's been the main challenge is like, how do you actually get that biopsy? Right, right. Yeah, that's tough. That's why you got to look into the proteome and see is a certain protein being upregulated. Okay. Another question you were saying, um, you know, or I guess two, one, you know, in terms of the blood vein brain barrier, I mean, can AAVs, can they actually pass through? Is it easier for nanoparticles? Uh, and then the second question is sort of like, you were saying that some people are actually immune. I mean, does that mean that if they get an AAV, like they, how, how would they respond if they were immune? I mean, yeah, I haven't been following the field of people developing newer AAVs that are resistant to the immune system, but I believe people are working on that quite heavily. So I think we're going to have ways to address that with AAVs, but there are alternatives as well. 
Um, I think what's going to happen in reality is that people will go more and more towards nanoparticles, which are more controlled and actually cheaper. So like, like I showed that the cost of AAVs is so high. So I think it's going to end up being that AAVs are used less and less uh, for safety and cost reasons. Um, and maybe, well, it, it's going to be another tool in the toolbox. So I, I don't think it's going to go away completely anytime soon. Um, but uh, I think nanoparticles will start to be used. So on the question of uh, blood-brain barrier penetration. So they're, the one I showed was this AEV, PHP, EB, and PHP, S that can cross into the spinal cord and brain. I've worked with those a little bit. Um, people have had success. It, it's kind of tricky how you actually use them. So uh, if you're doing mouse studies, you normally will inject the AEV in the tail vein. And when you inject in the tail vein, uh, you actually don't get much expression in the brain, but you can also deliver it to the bloodstream uh, via what's called retroorbital injection. Um, which is just under the eye. Um, and whenever you do injection into the retroorbital cavity, you actually have better expression in the brain, uh, probably because there's a sinus there and um, the the AV will kind of pull and it's near the brain. So it's, it's a little bit uh, silly to think of it, but actually delivering it uh, closer to the brain is actually better. And um, how I think this is going to actually happen in humans, um, you may use the PHP EV, but um, Delivering via the cisterna magna, which is uh, just in the back of the head, is probably the best way to deliver to the brain. But okay. even if you do that, um, if you know you can get it into the brain, um, into uh, what are called the ventricles, which are is the the cerebral spinal fluid circulating throughout your brain. That's where that uh, that fluid goes. Uh, even if you can get it there, it's very hard to get it to go throughout the entire brain, uh, just because there's a whole lot of tissue it has to go through and. It's not necessarily exposed to the entire uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So it's it's a very complicated thing to, to do in reality, but I think people will find better and better ways to do this, but it's just going to be a lot of trial and error to get there. Absolutely. And I know the brain is the probably the hardest organ to target to some degree. <laughs> uh, one other question, uh, and I know other people I'm sure have some questions too. Uh, you were saying about like being able to deliver genes that are say like unnatural. Um, you know, say I wanted to uh, deliver some genes to maybe grow a couple extra arms, like say I wanted to have four arms. Could I do that with a gene therapy to grow a few extra arms or? Yeah, yeah. so you, you'd be surprised. There have been some crazy things that have happened, mainly in lower organisms where um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the big thing was doing knockouts of every gene that we could and, and uh, lower organisms and, and mammals and uh, to see what they do, basically. Uh, so what people have found is that some do completely odd things. I, I can't remember if it was in zebrafish or drosophila, but there's one gene you can knock out. Uh, and basically, uh, all of a sudden, the organism has no head. Oh. Uh, so it's called the headless gene. So some people have hypothesized this is like, okay, uh, can you like, use this to sort of uh, regenerate organs or something. So there probably are going to be genes like this. Like, so there's a, um, what is it? The axolotl, I, I know you're pronouncing that incorrectly, but uh, people are looking into ways to potentially regenerate limbs using using these approaches. So it may be a foreign gene that, that leads to that. But uh, I think that may be better than um, some genes. So you have to be, you have to like realize, okay, if you're delivering something that's from a virus, it's potentially more toxic than like a, a gene from another organism that's not necessarily pathogenic to, uh, to, to humans, just because it's not designed to be pathogenic. But a virus is designed to get into your cell, so it has to kind of cause the cell to uptake the gene or the cell to be damaged in some way where the gene gets uptaken. So it's, it's kind of uh, something you need to think about in a little bit of context. But, but yes, you probably, you may be able to grow another arm. <laughs> But but you're talking about embryonic editing. You're not talking about someone's head falling off from gene therapy, right? That that is correct. Yes, yeah. That that is a very good point. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's so important to let people know that. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, uh, yeah. Wait, for, for for clarity though, I mean, you're talking about in a in a full organism, right? Like in, in um, like in a like some kind of animal or something, or. Yeah, no, I believe he's, talk, I, he's talking about in an embryonic form editing the genes and then the outcome from those edits being a mutated uh, version of the uh, organism. Yeah. 
that gene I'm talking about is called it's called the headless gene. I, I can't remember if it was in Drosophila or zebrafish. And uh, there's a lot of very strange names in zebrafish because people were starting with them de novo um, and coming up with gene names. But yes, this was a gene that was edited um, in the embryo and basically the organism developed with, with no head. So this shows that genes do a lot of very strange things that we don't expect. And so I think we're going to probably find some way to be able to like basically do the opposite of that, have things be regenerated. And so maybe even have part of your brain be regenerated if you have um, brain damage or uh, severe dementia that could potentially be possible using some gene that someone may discover. That would be the that would be the final frontier if you could regenerate the brain with this, right? Pretty much. Yep. I think, yeah, I think we're going to get there. That's probably going to be um, stem cell editing to uh, repopulate the brain. So it may not be one specific gene, but I think, I think we'll get there eventually. I'm not sure within- Michael Levin, or maybe it's Levine, is doing some amazing work. I think it's with uh, electrical stimulation. Maybe it's ultrasound, but I think it's electrical to do things like grow working eyes in the tails of salamanders. He'll be speaking at our GRG online meeting in, I don't know, it's in a in a week or two. So you're welcome to come and come and hear it directly from him, or you can look him up on YouTube. Yeah. And on the internet. Th that's fantastic. So one thing that I I've often thought about is like, okay, um, how can you make a mouse live longer since we we're mainly in the aging space? And um there's one very simple thought experiment you can do is you can make a mouse go for, so a mouse, an average mouse lives two to, to three years. How can you make it live 80 years? You can do that by gene editing it to become a human. So there's obviously some way to make a mouse live much, much longer, but what is like the minimum combinations of things you would need to do? So obviously that's a little bit ridiculous, but um, there, there are ways that we can have uh, eyes regenerate by becoming more like a salamander. And then you may have to do something like electrical stimulation to, but that's not a huge issue. Um, so there's gonna be ways we can do this for humans. It's just the question of how we actually do this. I think it's probably gonna be a combination of gene therapy then um, having something with AI to be able to predict this. Um, but it may be less complicated than even I think. Always using a combination uh, approach. I think that's that's smart. Um, nice, very, very, uh... Very good, Kyle. Any uh, any other questions for Kyle? Anyone have any uh, any want to jump in with any questions or comments? No, good. Well, I I did have uh, comments on the the viral deliveries and the and the integration. Uh, we know that um, AAV generally, if it integrates at all, integrates into chromosome nineteen in a safe site, and that's why there isn't a problem in humans. I do believe they did see a problem in some other model organisms, but that's good news. And and I I just want to make sure that um, people aren't you know separating the fact of uh, not wanting gene therapies to integrate. Our company specifically works on viral vectors that don't integrate because we don't want them to, but we want to use a viral vector because it has the longest expression of genes. So the lipid nanoparticles may give you a very short-term expression, so then you have a therapy that you have to take very often, whereas the vector delivery uh, modalities will last for five to 10 years. But I want to get away from the thought that we don't want to integrate, even though our company is focused on non-integrational uh, gene therapies, meaning not putting the genes into your chromosomes. CRISPR editing is exactly putting genes into the chromosomes and having a curative effect for a long lasting expression that will actually divide with cells. So the idea that we don't want to integrate is, is not actually true, especially for a lot of therapeutics. The early gene therapies, when gene therapy first started, was in the retrovirus space, and those integrate for sure, and they continue to integrate. And um, they did cause integrational mutagenesis, which is uh, having the outcome of cancer. The adenovirus, the one that shut down the industry in 1999, just has a very strong immune response. So the new vectors that came through, like the AAV, and now we use CMV, they're kind of a prized possession because they can get the genes into the cells. Generally, AAV can rarely integrate. CMV doesn't integrate. Right? So you don't have the problem of the disruption of the chromosome, but you do get the long-term expression. 
So, I mean, I think that that was just a super amazing talk, but I just wanted to make sure that I cleared that up for people who are listening that might be confused as to why uh, vector technology is still used over lipid nanoparticles. Um, I agree 100% with what you said. Yep. Um, outside of that, um, I, I, I did want to point out that, you know, the, the, the problem that happened with Jesse uh, Gilsinger and um, that happened in 2020 and 2021, unfortunately, were, were vastly oversight by the US FDA creating safe trials. And um, I think that it's important to note because, you know, clinical trials need to be vastly led by the companies who are doing those trials that we have to understand that our companies need to be leaders in this space. So, um, in 2020 and 2021, those kids who, who died of hepatotoxicity, they were given doses that were known to be toxic in non-human primates. And why that was allowed in a trial, we, we really don't understand that. And, and so it's, it's either the importance of the companies uh, being experts in their fields and looking at all of the literature and making sure that the FDA is duly um, aware of those um, limitations of the technology. So I, I did want to point that out that um, the, the blame of, of that going wrong is, is of a multitude. And, and here is why more people are using medical tourism, because we have shown and seen that a clinical trial is still an experiment and it's not necessarily a safe experiment if everyone in it does not take a hundred percent of of the um, understanding of the risk of that technology and so uh, my company does oversee uh, some uh, investigator-led studies outside of the united states and we have not seen uh, one negative outcome. And it's because companies and patients tend to stay way on the safer side of technology when they know that they're in an experimental space. And, and it's something that I would really like to and appreciate um, uh, my new plan, Best Choice Medicine, coming into the United States and helping de-risk these therapies for uh, the US FDA. And that's not a plug that just is you know, I'm I'm actually working on the regulatory space to uh, help ensure that patients who want to get access to life saving, potentially life saving medicine, can. But I loved your talk. I took so many notes during it. That is just fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, Liz, that's a great point because I think having personal accountability is the most important thing. You can't rely on the FDA to uh, basically ensure you have a safe trial. You need to design this yourself. Because you, you've been thinking, like, of course, you, you've been thinking about what you, you've been doing for much longer than FDA ever could. So you're going to know what can go wrong probably much better than FDA. So I think that's something that has been lacking in recent years with, with big pharma. Just because there's so many people involved, it's it's really hard to have personal accountability. You're like, well, um, maybe you aren't the one to worry about this and you think someone else will. And I think that's something that I'm seeing in the next generation of people who are leaders in biotech, like, like you, like realizing that, oh, if I don't make sure this is safe, no one else will. And I think that really creates the, the, um, the barrier to make sure that it, that it is safe. Um, I, I do have a question safe. for you. I was super excited. I also believe that there's going to be a combinatorial uh, therapy to treat all of aging. And I wanted to know your response because there were some areas where um, gene therapy is showing a uh, positive work, like in senescent cell clearing, where I think actually the better application is the small molecule controlled uh, way of doing that rather than turning on, you know, uh, a gene uh, that will then, you know, uh, eradicate all senescent cells. What are your thoughts on that? I, I I see these applications where I think that in the hallmarks of aging, there is definitely a pathway for small molecules. Yeah, uh, it's, it's something that is a complicated question, but I think kind of how I see it is um, right now in, in uh, addressing aging, we have so many low hanging fruit. And the reason that I'm working on small molecules now is that that's where the low hanging fruit was to basically clear senescent cells, which is uh, by like I've an, an analyzed all the mouse studies on longevity. 
that's one of the top ways to extend longevity in mice and potentially treat diseases and extend longevity in humans. So just there are um, safe small molecules that can be used in humans right now um, that could potentially make people live decades longer. So I think combinations are going to come about from this as well. So there are certain small molecules that can only target certain types of senescent cells in certain tissues. So combinations can result from that. And there are already even companies doing this with uh, supplements. And the problem with supplements, it's very tough to do studies to show that this is actually uh, something that, that's working in reality. So the gold standard still is FDA approval, um, but we are getting better and better at, at getting data to, to show uh, if something's working or not. So I think combinations will happen. And it's also something where it's tough to have a perfect response. And um, one example I've seen of this is someone who's trying to make an aging clock of blood proteins. Of um, So you take a blood sample and you analyze all those proteins and pr predict someone's age. And I, I remember what he saw is like, there are certain proteins that are better at it or not. So if you had like five proteins, you could do a pretty good job. And then if you add it up to like 20 proteins, you could do an even better job, maybe get 90% of the way there. And you could add on uh, the rest of the proteins up to 10,000 proteins. And then um, that may get, get you an even better answer, but it won't, it will never give you a perfect answer. So it, it's something where the first molecule may be the best or the first couple are what you need for the combination. And then any one addition to that won't help it much further. Well, I look forward to working with your company uh, along with our gene therapies. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's there's lots of things that can be potentially done. So um, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot in the coming years. Great. It's, a, it's an amazing field. It's, uh, there's so much potential. Um, one other question, uh, in, you're, you're talking about like the cost of AAV versus nanoparticles. Um, is there any way to kind of accelerate that decrease in cost for any particular method? Uh, and how much is kind of the, the difference between the methods? I mean, have, are, are we seeing like a pretty substantial decrease? And you were saying that the barrier to entry is, is fairly low. I just want to see, you know, what, what is the cost nowadays in, in general? And how is that trend going? Yeah. So, well, actually, I mean, if you dose yeah. lots of people, you have a, everyone has a lower cost. So by scale, you can actually make any gene therapy affordable if you're treating a, a large unmet need. Monogenic disease, you cannot bring the cost down. You have all of the, the development, you have a, a, a GMP drug, and then you have a very, very small population. Yeah, I think that's that's the best answer. But yeah, AAV is very expensive. Um, mRNA nanoparticles are now made for vaccines at a few dollars a dose. So just that alone shows that uh, nanoparticles are probably better, but viruses can be done at much cheaper cost. Liz, Liz probably knows this much, much better than I do. So I can't <laughs> Yeah, I know that. that. So for like a vaccine where you're looking for um, an mRNA expression for a matter of a few days, um, sure, that, that can be really inexpensive because you're only wanting to make as much of the spike protein as it takes to have an immune response. But if you're trying to do a gene therapy, especially one um, like uh, telomerase reverse transcriptase, where you're trying to target as many cells as possible, um, you're, you're, you're way beyond hepatotoxicity just to treat an organ, uh, probably with lipid nanoparticles at this point. So, um, you know, you're, you're looking for the least cost prohibitive. And then, so you're probably, you know, you're definitely looking at, at a viral vector at that point, but, um, you know, Again, a really short-term expression of, let's say, even folostatin, a gene that increases your muscle mass, if you only have that expressed for two days and the half-life is a matter of minutes to an hour, um, you're, you're probably going to have no net effect of the, the treatment. Right, right. That makes sense. Uh, another question, I mean, what I'm kind of wondering is also uh, with, with gene therapy, you're adding genes in. I know with CRISPR, you know, you can edit genes out. Is there any concept of taking genes out with gene therapy or does that just not, you have to use a different tool? Um, that they're all gene therapy. So, um, you know, that that's what Kyle was pointing out in his 
brilliant uh, presentation that I took a billion notes on. It's all gene therapy. So uh, whether you're taking in, taking out, um, whenever you're uh, modifying genes specifically, and then mRNA has kind of been put into that as well because it's a gene product. Um, it, it's all gene therapy. And, and the case for editing out genes is, is things like Huntington's disease, where, where people have these uh, multitude of copies. We all have this same gene. And then some of us have 20 of them. So some of us have 30 of them. But if you have over, like, I can't remember what it is, maybe Kyle knows it, like over a hundred of them or something like that, you have a severely fatal disease in middle life. And um, so we, science had not been able to tackle that at all before. And so CRISPR is one of those cases where it might be able to actually take some genes out. Plus, uh, as we saw it recently in sickle cell anemia, um, they're actually taking blood cells from patients, altering them to look like young, um, uh, what do they call them? Like fetal type cells. And these people no longer have sickle cell anemia. There are several several people treated with this now, um, and so this is this is an unlikely edit um, in which you uh, make a a person's own cell behave very differently uh, by taking it and editing it. So it's really exciting, but it's all gene therapy. Okay, gotcha. So the gene therapy is the high level technology. Is there a way to track? So like the way I understand, every time the cell divides, you're seeing mutations. Uh, occur over your lifetime. Is there a way to determine, kind of see that, like if you were getting ble a blood test, say every day, you could then see how your DNA is shifting over time. And could you then use gene therapy to essentially slow down or mitigate those mutations if you could somehow track it continuously or... Well, that's those DNA methylation tests. And that's what they do is they're kind of like looking at how your DNA methylation pattern looks over time. I don't think you'd have to do it every day. Uh, you could do it probably a couple of times a year. And then um, I think uh, Kyle can probably speak to that. I'm trying to make it more conversational because <laughs> I I know that that's what you, were, you, you wanted. But um, yeah, no. Uh, the the Yamanaka factors um, or the OSKs are the only thing that we know right now that really um, seems to remap um, the uh, methylation to a more youthful state. Um, ironically, it doesn't give huge lifespan gains in model organisms, but along with other therapies, um, I'm guessing that it could be quite exponential. But Kyle, do you know much about the Yamanaka factors and the, the OSKs in general? That's actually one of the gene therapies, as he was explaining, um, that doxycycline control is uh, one of the therapies that they're working on with that in, in mice. So you give them doxycycline, the, the gene therapy turns on, the reprogramming uh, goes into effect and then you stop taking it. And the the uh, hope is, is that it stops doing that. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. So um, basically once you have a mutation, basically you, you can't undo it. Um, that's, it's gonna be there. Um, and mutations turn out to not be as big of a problem as we thought. So kind of the theory of aging for a long time was you have these mutations that lead to aging. And it seems to be not the case so much. I forget the person who, who studied this, but there, there's someone who studied this explicitly. And what ended up happening was he found that, oh, it's not the mutations, it's actually the epigenetic changes, just as Liz was saying. And using Yamanaka factors can re reduce or reverse the epigenetics back to uh, age zero. Um, so if you take someone's cells that are eight years old, you can reverse them back to, to age zero. Um, and if you think about it, our our uh, DNA is actually billions of, of years old. It, it comes, all of our cells come from our parents and they come from their parents and so on and so on. So all these mutations have accumulated for a long time. And that's another reason to think of your cells as spaghetti code, because all these mutations have happened for billions of years. And um, there's even things that are completely uh, non-functional in our DNA. People, uh, a little bit incorrectly, used to call most of our DNA a, a graveyard of viruses and bacterial genomes that have gotten integrated, that kind of got deactivated, but um, they're just kind of hanging out there. Some of them do have functions, though, um, sometimes by accident, um, but oftentimes there's, there's nothing there. So basically, our DNA is just completely messed up. Uh, there are 
things that, uh, and then they get optimized a little bit over time. So you can have something completely get messed up and maybe it gets optimized over time. So it's it's a very complicated uh, question to, to answer, but mutations are definitely a problem, but probably in the course of our lifetime, what's probably more important is actually the epigenetic changes. One exception to that is in cancer where mutations can lead to cancer. So that is something that is, is studied quite heavily is what mutations result in cancer and um, different cancer types, what mutations occur. Very interesting. One thing I've been thinking about, so they, they came out uh, recently with uh, this this study or, or these results that they're, they're saying now that you can actually make proteins that um, never occurred in, in nature. Uh, and so what, I, what I'm wondering is that I mean, with with MNR, mRNA, with with some kind of gene therapy technology, um, you know, could we de deliver a, a gene or, or multiple genes into the cell that would create proteins that that have never actually existed in humans that would operate some level of the cellular machinery in a more, say, efficient and uh, sort of optimized way? I was curious what what your guys' thoughts on uh, kind of the. Like it's still within biology, you know, it wouldn't be non-biological, but it would be non-human, I guess, to some degree. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of a better answer. I should have a better answer for this one because I worked in structural biology for uh, graduate school. Um, but yes, you can make proteins that do different things. So for example, you can make an antibody that has some cytotoxic protein or even a cytotoxic chemical attached. That's something that people use a lot to basically get rid of cancer cells. Um, so a lot of these applications are actually in cancer uh, because it's a lot easier to uh, kill something than it is to make it better. So uh, people are like, oh, cancer, this is something we, you want to kill all the cancer cells. So a lot of these applications ended up uh, coming first in cancer. And so that that's actually a, a good model that I always look at is the, the field of cancer because They've had amazing success in developing therapeutics that have saved a lot of people um, because they were able to think out of the box and think like, okay, we can engineer something completely new, just like you said, and then potentially save a lot of people's lives. So um, yes, you, you definitely can engineer things that are very, very much like things that occur in our body, uh, up to things that have never existed in humans before and maybe are from some or other organism and even come up with something that hasn't been in any organism. Uh, it's a little bit tougher to do that de novo, but there are people doing that. I believe it's David Baker's lab who does a lot of that kind of work, if you want to look into it further. There's an interesting study, um, actually clinical trial that went on with people with congenital blindness of the, where they took the genes from light sensing algae and put them into human eyes. And that started uh, back in 2016. And they've had great success of some people being able to pick up light now who were uh, once blind. But I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Wow, that's that's amazing, right? I mean, on its own. Um... No, no, yeah, yeah. The thinking is like, you know, the cell is, you know, has this machinery, and you know, we've we've gotten so far with what nature has provided, but uh, I think that we can engineer things that um, have never been created on Earth, and uh, by by because of evolution, you know, had limited time, limited resources, limited experiments, uh, we can engineer something completely new. Um, but obviously, you know, you have to be careful with what you're. Uh, experimenting with, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. It, being careful, it's it's all a matter of perspective as well. Because if if you're a cancer patient and you're going to die, I mean, yeah, you probably want to try the gene therapy that maybe you have a 50-50 shot of, of living because of that. Um, maybe there's going to be some safety effects. But if you're uh, 18 years old and you're mostly fine, like maybe you don't want to try something that's a little bit more risky, but it, it's also a matter of personal preference as well. So if someone like, oh, this could potentially make me live 30 years longer and th the risk isn't that high. I know like people have used this before, this gene therapy or other medication before, then maybe they, they want to use that. As long as I think they understand fully the risk, um, then they can. And, and people are more and more informed than ever. So it's, it's more easy to find information on things. Um, so that that's also helps a lot as well. Hundred percent agree. I think uh, people should be able to 
to make that decision, people should be able to choose. You know? Oh, and actually this has changed recently. Um, there's this right to try act that was signed under, under the Trump administration and it never really went anywhere where basically this is something where you could take medicines that are in clinical trials. And uh, there have been even people who have proposed like after phase one clinical trials, which are the clinical trials for safety, that people should be able to, uh, or, or companies should be able to license their their drugs to people or, or um, not licensed to auto, are already uh, market their drugs to people and sell them to, to doctors to get these into patients uh, who need them as, as quickly as possible. Um, and just this week, there's been some changes in that, that bill um, that basically they're trying to allow more and more people to access this. And the reason that uh, this didn't really go anywhere is uh, yeah, people do now have the right to try different medicines but if a drug company is making this medicine and they're under FDA clinical trials, they may not want to market it to people and say like, yes, you can use our medicine because uh, if if someone uses it and something goes wrong, uh, then this may be a black mark on the record to say like, oh, someone took our drug and they ended up dying. And it could have been the cancer patient who was about to die anyway, but that's that's always tough to to show. And if it was someone healthy, then you, you never know what can happen. Yeah. So, and I think they're trying to limit a liability for um, companies and, and maybe the government as well. That's uh, the best choice medicine plan that I'm pushing for is kind of like uh, right to try uh, on steroids. It's um, the problem with most advanced medicine and innovative medicine is it hasn't been in phase one. And so, you know, my push is towards uh, getting innovative medicine that that companies have not gotten into phase one, because historically, it takes five to $10 million of non predictive, unfortunately, animal studies in order to get into phase one trial. So most of the most promising medicine is not even in phase one. And um, yeah, I think that people need access to it. I hope I agree. It's um it's a precarious, uh, tricky system we have, and hopefully, our uh, the people in um, you know at, at the top can can see what you know what's happening. I mean, when you have therapies and interventions that um, people should be able to to use. I mean, here, not necessarily going to Mexico or going out of the country. Uh, you know, it should be there. Um, you know, especially if they're if they're terminal, especially. Um, so, hundred percent agree. Awesome. Well, this was good. Um, any uh, any other thoughts on any of the topics here? Um, just my overall message is I'm very positive about gene therapy, and I know it's going to be the the future. Basically, people have already decided, so that's where all the money is going. And but at the same time, I always emphasize it is just a tool. Having developed some mRNA lipid nanoparticles and worked with AEVs, keep in mind it is a tool. So. Um, small molecules. So um, like people say they are still positive about funding small molecules, but I've seen kind of the opposite from um, uh, VCs, uh, venture capitalists that are really looking to fund genetic medicines. I think because they see it as something that's kind of magic, but it is it is another tool. Um, and, and so I think we need to keep that in mind is that all these have applications. Um, and I think that's going to be the case for the next hundred years. I, I can't really well, it's tough to predict even the next few years, but um, I think, yeah, we're going to see all of these things be be useful. I would agree. I think we're just starting out with gene therapy. I mean, I think there's going to be big, big dollars coming in and there's going to be so much investment. I mean, now that we're seeing some results, I mean, now that we're seeing before and after biomarkers for, for these therapies, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we're going to see a massive inflow of uh, capital um, new delivery mechanisms, you know, how do we get, um, deliver mRNA to every cell in the body? You know, it's a, a problem we haven't been able to solve, but I think we will. Uh, how do we target, like you were alluding to Kyle, specific tissues or specific organs? Uh, and then how do we know, did it work? You know, if I'm targeting the kidney and, uh, the therapy goes to my liver, it's very tricky. Like, did it regenerate my kidney? Did it not? Um, but I think, uh, we will be able to tell through through the the proteome uh, and maybe other um, mm -hmm. methods. Um, yeah. Special thanks to Liz for being patient zero and also the recent positive results of their Alzheimer's trial. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Johnny.
Yeah, that's something that takes a lot of guts. And I, I'm seeing that more and more is that um, people who are developing these medicines, they end up taking them first. There's a lot of people who are developing natural molecules that no one has really used before. And then the scientists or the, the PI of the lab who's developing, they end up taking it first. I think that takes a lot of guts. Um, and it's all, and then seeing positive results is even better. So uh, that's fantastic. Well, it, it's a scientific tradition with many bold adventures. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that was uh, that was a little scary. I'm sure the first time. <laughs> yeah, I think in retrospect, it's always easy to say, "Oh, it was a it was a no brainer." And um, but I we're we're working on um, some a book uh, about that and why I did that and you know you know what the potential is for people in the future with this type of technology. And I had to go back and read all my old notes from the diary that I kept during the time. And it was no joke. I was uh, I was worried, and um, I mean, we felt like we, you know, could either, you know, save eight billion people, or, or um, I may not be alive much longer. And it was a real trip reading through those notes and, and listening to my thought process. But I was a hundred percent committed. And you're, uh, and you're. Uh... Alive and well now, so we're glad. Yeah, so hindsight is like so 2020. I'd be like, oh, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, we were just thinking, you know, let's just do this. <laughs> I could be really cool about it, but I, I was having some sweats. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I was having some sweats. And yeah. I think, um, you know, at all the gene therapies I've seen, I think these, you know, um, the more I dig into the longevity, the more I realize how important muscle is. And I feel like some of these ones that you've gotten, like the Folistan one, I mean, being able to build and maintain your muscle, that is really the key uh, to some degree to longevity. If you can build and maintain your muscle, uh, you're much less likely to get an age-related disease. So um, yeah, it's good for your, your metabolic health. I've, I've taken four genes now and um, all of them are either targeted hallmarks of aging or, or gero protectors against aging. And, and you're right. We know that people with more muscle mass tend to live longer than their peers. Definitely. Definitely. So you got the, the telomerous, um, the, the uh, protein, the uh, muscle one, Polistatin, and then two others. Uh, Clotho and one called PGC1 alpha, and they're all natural um, human genes. Uh, and, you know, things like PGC1 alpha and folistatin are upregulated when you're exercising. So it's just kind of like a little boost of, of a natural uh, health associated geroprotector. Interesting. Wow. Well, I'm confident that you'll be alive in a hundred years. So, oh, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully, no matter what, um, people benefit from from the things that we started, and 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 that's what we hope. Definitely, no. That's that's a good, um, you know, that's a good mission, and you know, um, and you guys know our mission. We want to uh, slow down and uh, reverse the aging process through these tools and technologies that are now coming to fruition. So, um, thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Liz. Oh. Thanks, Kyle.